Thank you, Cheryl, and hi, everybody here in the room. You know the joke, behind every successful man, there is a profoundly surprised woman. <laughs> That's not referring to my husband. I have two teenagers at home, and a third one, smaller. So why did I come all the way here, 11 hours of flight, to give this TED talk? It was worth it, I tell you. This surprised, unbelieving, unbelieving face of my children, of the teenagers. What? You, mommy? You're going to talk at TED? <laughs> then I decided I'm going. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Silicon Valley. I know it's a very techy place here. I don't want to talk about technology today. I want to share with you what technology can and will be doing to people's life and in particular, what broadband internet access can do to the life of the people in sub-Saharan Africa. So why, is that, so why is this transformational effect of broadband on the life of the people of sub-Saharan Africa? Let's look for a minute at the situation today. Sub-Saharan Africa historically had the highest uh, subscription price for internet running between $150 to $200 a month. The result was very low penetration, 1% broadband penetration. Compare it to Switzerland, 85% broadband penetration. And the service was, or still is, of full quality, slow and unstable, and targeted mainly to corporates, not to the mass market. So this is what created the digital divide. But now it's all changing. Now broadband is coming to Africa. Why is it happening now? There are a couple of things that are happening. Fiber optic submarine cables have been laid, creating a dramatic increase in capacity. Prices go down. End user devices, like the dongles and the modems and the chipset of the computers and the smartphones, all of these devices, prices go down. In India, you can buy tablets for less than $100. Same effect. Third one is the technology of today. Africa has very little network in the ground. Little copper, little fiber optics. But Africa is well known for its leapfrogging capacities. So if you look at the telephone industry, it just skipped the fixed telephony generation, went straight into the wireless mobile telephones. Same thing is and will be happening on the broadband. No need for the last mile access to the consumer. No need for it to be based on ADSL type of fixed line. Can go straight to the wireless. Another very fascinating and actually good thing that is happening is the growth in GDP. Africa is one of the fastest growing economies worldwide. Projected growth of between 5 to 6% yearly compared with 1% to 2% for the industrialized world. There is a huge growth of consumer power, of people who have money and want to look into new services. There is this growing middle. In Nigeria alone, in the last five years, there have been an increase of 10 million middle-class consumers who joined the market. 313 million people in Africa are middle class, defined as middle class. It's one third of the population. There is regionalization effect and urbanization effect. So all in all, the consumer has much more access to broadband internet through all of these changes. But the one single most important factor is very specific to Africa, and that's the demography. In Africa, 50% of the people are below the age of 20. This is beautiful. This is the youngest con continent in the world, and it's the fastest growing young population in the world. And these are the preferred customers of the internet industry, because these are the early adopters. These are the uptakers, the people who are eager to be there and try and use it and be online and be happy about it. So let me share with you a little bit of my personal experience. Earlier this year, we launched our broadband mobile internet access in Cameroon, in, in, in the two largest cities of Douala and Cameroon. 
So I go into the office to talk to Joseph Abena, our online marketing manager. Now, Joseph is very young, very talented Cameroonian. And he tells me, hey, Anat, I realize you don't have a Facebook account. <laughs> OK, so I go quickly, I open a Facebook account, and I forget about it. After a week, notification from Joseph. Hey, Anat, you didn't have any activity, and you have no friends there. <laughs> That's getting to be very, very embarrassing. <laughs> so I say, OK, Joseph, you know, I don't have the time for this. It's very important. I don't know what to do on Facebook. I just feel like a stranger in a cocktail party who doesn't know how to do the t small talk. <laughs> so Joseph writes, why not friend with Dove? Now, Dove is my husband and my business partner in all of those telecom companies. That sounds like a good idea. So thanks to Joseph Abena, I have a Facebook account, and I have a Facebook friend. <laughs> what I want to show is that Sub-Saharan Africa is a very poor, it's one of the poorest places in the world. But it has such excitement and energy about this whole online world. What do all of these young people want to do? You thought I was going to say sex, right? <laughs> you there, this is what you thought. Now, look at the picture. They want to go online. They want to be connected. connected. They want to go to Twitter and Facebook and Google and LinkedIn. And they want to do everything else that we are doing here. And this is going to happen. Now, can they pay for this? Well, if you look at the way that Africa embraced mobile telephony, you'll say yes. I took this picture in one of the most remote, rural, poor areas of Rwanda. But no matter how far away you go, you always find a person selling MTN telephony services. And this is exactly what's going to happen on the internet. There is this huge spillover effect. You start selling in the cities, and we'll be selling after that in the rural areas. We start selling to the people who can afford it today, and they will drag with them the people who would be able to afford it tomorrow. We see it with our employees. A guy takes home his PC, and he's got an internet connection provided by us. The day after, five of his kids and 10 kids from the neighborhood, they're all online using this one single PC. So why is broadband so important for Africa? Africa suffers from three challenges. One of them is this huge growth of population. The second one is unemployment. And then comes this poor infrastructure. The huge growth of population, the numbers are mind-boggling. Actually, when you think about it, in Sub-Saharan Africa, there are today 880 million people. And it's supposed, it's projected to be 2 billion in year 2050. So this blessing of fast growth has to be tackled by huge investment in human capital. Otherwise, the, 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 the children of today are going to be poorer when they grow up, poorer than the parents today. The answer is, how do you tackle that? Education, that's the key. Unemployment, huge numbers. And what's most worrying, it's amongst the young people. So the workforce of Africa today, we're talking about 500 million already. This is supposed to be growing to 1.1 billion in year 2040. This is going to be the biggest workforce worldwide. But they have to compete. They have to compete with other wor workforces from cheaper places. In order to be able to compete, they must acquire all the skills that they need, modern, relevant to our lives, technological, close to the internet. The children of today, if they don't have access to the internet, if they don't know how to surf, if they don't know how to look for information, buy and sell online, they don't have a lot of chance of competing there. So how do you do this thing? How do you give this huge amount of people the opportunity to get this education? Rwanda is a great example. Rwanda is a poor country. It has little natural resources, very small arable land. And President Kagama said, we have to turn ourselves. We have to turn our society. We've got to be knowledge-based society. We've got to be technically oriented. We have to be the ICT hub of East Africa. 
So how do you do this? He did two things. He switched the formal language of the country from French into English, and he prolonged the schooling years, mandatory schooling years from six years into nine years. Great, but where do you find all the teachers? Teachers must be there to teach this huge amount of kids English. So I think the answer is pretty easy. Huh? It's almost intuitive, it's simple, it's e-learning. You teach the children directly, or you teach the teachers, and you do it online, real-time, e-education, using the broadband. So you can have the teachers with the best English accent and the best pedagogical background. They will be teaching the children of Rwanda, but they will be there physically in the US or the UK. So it's very obvious now why broadband is playing such a major role in these countries. But English is not enough. You've got to equip these kids with all of the relevant skills. And in this global and cloud world of today, the relevant skills are clear. You've got to have broadband in order to let them practice with that. And if those kids get access to broadband, they will be able to make a huge shift in the way that the economies of these countries are working. They will take their economies up the value chain. They will be less dependent on the natural resources, and they could much more be involved as a service society, sophisticated service society, which is very labor in intensive. Besides this, there's a, there are other effects for broadband on these economies. A 10% increase in broadband penetration increases the G DGP, GDP of developing countries by, by around 1.4%. So how does that happen? First of all, it creates entrepreneurship. The price of opening a business is diminishing, and it empowers the existing entrepreneurs because they can communicate with the clients and suppliers, and they can know much more about the competition and the productivity level is increasing. No wonder that Google now went to Nigeria and they're taking 5,000 entrepreneurs and bringing them online and helping them to open their websites. Other things that are happening is the communication becoming much cheaper if you have broadband. It's not only about the email, it's the fact that you can do voice over IP communication like Skype. So that helps a lot in countries where the infrastructure is so poor. And then there is a huge technology transfer. There is an increase in the productivity of the labor. And there is an innovation. And one central thing that is playing in this whole story is the creation of local content. As I mentioned before, the people there they would very much, or the young people there, they would very much like to be online. They would like to enjoy everything that we're doing here. They would like to have local content. They need to have the maps of where they need to go to, the possibility to buy and sell, classified aids to look for houses, etc. So for local content to be created, you need the infrastructure. It's like a vicious circle, but on a positive note. Melinda Gate, in one of her previous talks in TED, she said that one of the most effective strategies in Africa is to tap into the local entrepreneurship. The local entrepreneurs are the ones who know the tastes and preferences of the markets. And she mentioned how Coca-Cola is doing it. Well, going and letting people develop their own local content is the best way to achieve this result. And local content have been already developed in Africa to a certain extent. There is a nice story about a platform called Ushaidi, which was created in Nairobi in 2007. There were unrest, but there was no, no distribution of information about what's going on, at least not by the formal channels. So this platform helped mapping and gathering information that was sent to them from the public. It was sent by text messaging, emails, social networks. It got all together, and then everybody was informed about the bad things that are happening, and most important, where are they happening? Today, this platform became 
the world default platform for announcement about crisis. And it was used in the tsunami in Japan and in the earthquake of Haiti. So until now, I was basically talking about the vision. And the vision is beautiful. Let's take this Silicon Savannah in Nairobi, Kenya, which is almost a copy of the Silicon Valley. And let's take all of these young developers who sit there and work on the killer app for the mobile and move them to the internet. Let them come up with the local content and the killer app for the internet. So from this beautiful vision, vision is very nice, you know, it's nice and fine, we need to start from that, but let's, let's turn it into reality. Let's talk a little bit about how it's happening. How can we make this into a reality, the acceleration of broadband into Africa and making sure that Africa really benefits from all of these beautiful things? So first of all, big warning, trade, not aid. You want to help Africa? Come do business there. There is enough philanthropy that was taking place, and the results were questionable. The other reality check that at least we in particular had was how do you sell there? How do you, how do you distribute there? In our previous life, in our internet company in Europe, we were teaming up with MediaMarkt, which is the equivalent of Best Buy in the US. We were growing by 150,000 subscribers a month. So we said, oh, this is wonderful. Let's go, copy paste it to Sub-Saharan Africa, team up with the biggest distribution channel, and that's it. Surprise, surprise, this is what we found. These are the distribution channels. So again, we needed to tap into local entrepreneurship and get into these distribution channels and get our products down to the point of sale. So now if you go, you can buy in this uh, umbrellas, bananas, shoe shine, and access to the internet. You just buy prepaid cards and you can become a client. So here's my favorite photo. I really hope that this guy is gonna get, is gonna learn online. He's gonna apply to a good university online, and he's going to possess all of the skills that he needs in this global and cloud world. And you, all of these people in the Silicon Valley, the venture capitalists, the cloud people, the content people, let's take all of the energy from here, all of the power from the Silicon Valley, and let's empower the Sub-Saharan Valley. We cannot leave one billion people behind and talk about a better world. Let's all help close the digital divide. And I thank you in advance.